Chapter Fifteen of Joe's Boys by Louisa May Alcott. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Joe's Boys by Louisa May Alcott. Chapter Fifteen Waiting. My wife, I have bad news for thee, said Professor Bear, coming in one day early in January please tell me at once i can't bear to wait fritz cried mrs joe dropping her work and standing up as if to take the shot bravely but we must wait and hope hearts dearest come and let us bear it together emil's ship is lost and as yet no news of him it was well mr bear had taken his wife into his strong arms for she looked ready to drop but bore up after a moment and sitting by her good man heard all that there was to tell tidings had been sent to the shipowners at hamburg by some of the survivors and telegraphed at once by franz to his uncle as one boatload was safe there was hope that others might also escape though the gale had sent two to the bottom a swift sailing steamer had brought these scanty news and happier ones might come at any hour but kind franz had not added that the sailors reported the captain's boat as undoubtedly wrecked by the falling mast since the smoke hid its escape and the gale soon drove all far asunder but this sad rumor reached plumfield in time and deep was the mourning for the happy-hearted commodore never to come singing home again mrs joe refused to believe it stoutly insisting that emile would outlive any storm and yet turn up safe and gay it was well she clung to this hopeful view for poor mr bear was much afflicted by the loss of his boy because his sister's sons had been his so long he scarcely knew a different love for his very own now was a chance for mrs juno to keep her word and she did speaking cheerily of emile even when hope waxed faint and her heart was heavy if anything could comfort the bears for the loss of one boy it would have been the affection and sorrow shown by all the rest franz kept the cable busy with his varying messages nat sent loving letters from Leipzig, and tom harassed the shipping agents for news even busy jack wrote them with unusual warmth dolly and george came often bearing the loveliest flowers and the daintiest bonbons to cheer mrs bear and sweeten josie's grief while good-hearted ned travelled all the way from chicago to press their hands and say with a tear in his eye i was so anxious to hear all about the dear old boy i couldn't keep away that's right comfortable and shows me that if i didn't teach my boys anything else i did give them brotherly love that will make them stand by one another all their lives said mrs joe when he had gone rob answered reams of sympathizing letters which showed how many friends they had and the kindly praises of the lost man would have made emile a hero and a saint had they all been true the elders bore it quietly having learned submission in life's hard school but the younger people rebelled some hoped against hope and kept up others despaired at once and little josie emile's pet cousin and playmate was so broken-hearted nothing could comfort her nan dosed in vain daisy's cheerful words went by like the wind and bess's devices to amuse her all failed utterly to cry in mother's arms and talk about the wreck which haunted her even in her sleep was all she cared to do and mrs meg was getting anxious when miss cameron sent josie a kind note bidding her learn bravely her first lesson in real tragedy and be like the self-sacrificing heroines she loved to act that did the little girl good and she made an effort in which teddy and doc too helped her much 
for the boy was deeply impressed by this sudden eclipse of the firefly whose light and life all missed when they were gone and lured her out every day for long drives behind the black mare who shook her silvery bells till they made such merry music josie could not help listening to it and whisked her over the snowy roads at a pace which set the blood dancing in her veins and sent her home strengthened and comforted by sunshine fresh air and congenial society three aids young sufferers seldom can resist as emile was helping nurse captain hardy safe and well aboard the ship all this sorrow would seem wasted but it was not for it drew many hearts more closely together by a common grief taught some patience some sympathy some regret for faults that lie heavy on the conscience when the one sinned against is gone and all of them the solemn lesson to be ready when the summons comes a hush lay over plumfield for weeks and the studious faces on the hill reflected the sadness of those in the valley sacred music sounded from parnassus to comfort all who heard the brown cottage was besieged with gifts for the little mourner and emile's flag hung at half-mast on the roof where he last sat with mrs joe so the weeks went heavily by till suddenly like a thunderbolt out of a clear sky came the news all safe letters on the way then up went the flag out rang the college bells bang went teddy's long unused cannon and a chorus of happy voices cried thank, thank god. god as people went about laughing crying and embracing one another in a rapture of delight by and by the longed-for letters came and all the story of the wreck was told briefly by emile eloquently by mrs hardy gratefully by the captain while mary added a few tender words that went straight to their hearts and seemed the sweetest of all never were letters so read passed round admired and cried over as these for mrs joe carried them in her pocket when mr bear did not have them in his and both took a look at them when they said their prayers at night now the professor was heard humming like a big bee again as he went to his classes and the lines smoothed out of mother bear's forehead while she wrote this real story to anxious friends and let her romances wait now messages of congratulation flowed in and beaming faces showed everywhere rob amazed his parents by producing a poem which was remarkably good for one of his years and demi set it to music that it might be sung when the sailor boy returned teddy stood on his head literally and tore about the neighborhood on octu like a second paul revere only his tidings were good but best of all little josie lifted up her head as the snowdrops did and began to bloom again growing tall and quiet with the shadow of past sorrow to tone down her former vivacity and show that she had learned a lesson in trying to act well her part on the real stage where all have to take their share in the great drama of life now another sort of waiting began for the travellers were on their way to hamburg and would stay there a while before coming home as uncle herman owned the brenda and the captain must report to him emile must remain to franz's wedding deferred till now because of the season of mourning so happily ended these plans were doubly welcome and pleasant after the troublous times which went before and no spring ever seemed so beautiful as this one for as teddy put it now is the winter of our discontent made glorious by these sons of bear franz and emile being regarded in the light of elder brothers by the real sons of bear there was great scrubbing and dusting among the matrons as they set their houses in order not only for class day but to receive the bride and groom who were to come to them for the honeymoon trip 
great plans were made gifts prepared and much joy felt at the prospect of seeing franz again though emile who was to accompany them would be the greater hero little did the dear souls dream what a surprise was in store for them as they innocently laid their plans and wished all the boys could be there to welcome home their eldest and their casablanca while they wait and work so happily let us see how our other absent boys are faring as they too wait and work and hope for better days nat was toiling steadily along the path he had wisely chosen though it was by no means strewn with flowers quite thorny was it in fact and hard to travel after the taste of ease and pleasure he had got when nibbling at forbidden fruit but his crop of wild oats was a light one and he resolutely reaped what he had sowed finding some good wheat among the tares he taught by day he fiddled night after night in the dingy little theatre and he studied so diligently that his master was well pleased and kept him in mind as one to whom preferment was due if any chance occurred gay friends forgot him but the old ones stood fast and cheered him up when heimweh and weariness made him sad as spring came on things mended expenses grew less work pleasanter and life more bearable than when wintry storms beat on his thinly clad back and frost pinched the toes that patiently trudged in old boots no debts burdened him the year of absence was nearly over and if he chose to stay herr bergmann had hopes for him that would bring independence for a time at least so he walked under the lindens with a lighter heart and in the may evenings went about the city with a band of strolling students making music before houses where he used to sit as guest no one recognized him in the darkness though old friends often listened to the band and once minna threw him money which he humbly received as part of his penance being morbid on the subject of his sins his reward came sooner than he expected and was greater than he deserved he thought though his heart leaped with joy when his master one day informed him that he was chosen with several other of his most promising pupils to join the musical society which was to take part in the great festival in london the next july here was not only honor for the violinist but happiness for the man as it brought him nearer home and would open a chance of further promotion and profit in his chosen profession make thyself useful to buckmeister there in london with thy english and if all goes well with him he will be glad to take thee to america whither he goes in the early autumn for winter concerts thou hast done well these last months and i have hopes for thee as the great bergman seldom praised his pupils these words filled nat's soul with pride and joy and he worked yet more diligently than before to fulfil his master's prophecy he thought the trip to england happiness enough but found room for more when early in june franz and emile paid him a flying visit bringing all sorts of good news kind wishes and comfortable gifts for the lonely fellow who could have fallen on their necks and cried like a girl at seeing his old mates again how glad he was to be found in his little room busy at his proper work not living like an idle gentleman on borrowed money how proud he was to tell his plans assure them that he had no debts and receive their praises for his improvement in music Music, their respect for his economy and steadfastness in well-doing how relieved when having honestly confessed his shortcomings they only laughed and owned that they also had known like experiences and were the wiser for them 
he was to go to the wedding late in june and join his comrades in london as best man he could not refuse the new suit franz insisted on ordering for him and a check from home about that time made him feel like a millionaire and a happy one for this was accompanied by such kind letters full of delight in his success he felt that he had earned it and waited for his joyful holiday with the impatience of a boy dan meantime was also counting the weeks till august when he would be free but neither marriage bells nor festival music awaited him no friends would greet him as he left the prison no hopeful prospect lay before him no happy home-going was to be his yet his success was far greater than nat's though only god and one good man saw it it was a hard-won battle but he would never have to fight so terrible a one again for though enemies would still assail from within and from without he had found the little guide-book that christian carried in his bosom and love penitence and prayer the three sweet sisters had given him the armor which would keep him safe he had not learned to wear it yet and chafed against it though he felt its value thanks to the faithful friend who had stood by him all that bitter year soon he was to be free again worn and scarred in the fray but out among men in the blessed sun and air when he thought of it dan felt as if he could not wait but must burst that narrow cell and fly away as the caddis worms he used to watch by the brookside shed their stony coffins to climb the ferns and soar into the sky night after night he lulled himself to sleep with planning how when he had seen mary mason according to his promise he would steer straight for his old friends the indians and in the wilderness hide his disgrace and heal his wounds working to save the many would atone for the sin of killing one he thought and the old free life would keep him safe from the temptations that beset him in cities by and by when i'm all right again and have something to tell that i'm not ashamed of i'll go home he said with a quicker beat of the impetuous heart that longed to be there so intensely he found it as hard to curb as one of his unbroken horses on the plains not yet i must get over this first they'd see and smell and feel the prison taint on me if i went now and i couldn't look them in the face and hide the truth i can't lose ted's love mother bears confidence and the respect of the girls for they did respect my strength anyway but now they wouldn't touch me and poor dan looked with a shudder at the brown fist he clenched involuntarily as he remembered what it had done since a certain little white hand had laid in it confidingly i'll make em proud of me yet and no one shall ever know of this awful year i can wipe it out and i will so help me god and the clenched hand was held up as if to take a solemn oath that this lost year should yet be made good if resolution and repentance could work the miracle end of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of joe's boys by louisa may alcott this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org joe's boys by louisa may alcott chapter sixteen in the tennis courts athletic sports were in high favor at plumfield and the river where the old punt used to wobble about with a cargo of small boys or echo to the shrill screams of little girls trying to get lilies now was alive with boats of all kinds from the slender wherry to the trim pleasure craft gay with cushions awnings and fluttering pennons every one rode and the girls as well as the youths had their races and developed their muscles in the most scientific manner the large level meadow near the old willow was now the college playground and here baseball battles raged with fury varied by football leaping and kindred sports fitted to split the fingers break the ribs and strain the backs of the two ambitious participants 
the gentler pastimes of the damsels were at a safe distance from this champ de mars croquet mallets clicked under the elms that fringed the field rackets rose and fell energetically in several tennis courts and gates of different heights were handy to practise the graceful bound by which every girl expected to save her life some day when the mad bull who was always coming but never seemed to arrive should be bellowing at her heels one of these tennis grounds was called joe's court and here the little lady ruled like a queen for she was fond of the game and being bent on developing her small self to the highest degree of perfection she was to be found at every leisure moment with some victim hard at it on a certain pleasant sunday afternoon she had been playing with bess and beating her for though more graceful the princess was less active than her cousin and cultivated her roses by quieter methods oh dear you are tired and every blessed boy is at that stupid baseball match what shall i do sighed josie pushing back the great red hat she wore and gazing sadly round her for more worlds to conquer i'll play presently when i'm a little cooler but it is dull work for me as i never win answered bess fanning herself with a large leaf josie was about to sit down beside her on the rustic seat and wait when her quick eye saw afar off two manly forms arrayed in white flannel their blue legs seemed bearing them towards the battle going on in the distance but they never reached the fray for with a cry of joy joe raced away to meet them bent on securing this heaven-sent reinforcement both paused as she came flying up and both raised their hats but oh what difference there was in the salutes the stout youth pulled his off lazily and put it on again at once as if glad to get the duty over the slender being with the crimson tie lifted his with a graceful bend and held it aloft while he accosted the rosy breathless maid thus permitting her to see his raven locks smoothly parted with one little curl upon the brow dolly prided himself upon that bow and practised it before his glass but did not bestow it upon all alike regarding it as a work of art fit only for the fairest and most favoured of his female admirers for he was a pretty youth and fancied himself an adonis eager josie evidently did not appreciate the honour he did her for with a nod she begged them both to come along and play tennis not go and get all hot and dirty with the boys these two adjectives won the day for stuffy was already warmer than he liked to be and dolly had on a new suit which he desired to keep immaculate as long as possible conscious that it was very becoming charm to oblige answered the polite one with another bend ah oh, you play i'll rest added the fat boy yearning for repose and gentle converse with the princess in the cooling shade well you can comfort miss for i've beaten her to bits and she needs amusing i know you've got something nice in your pocket george give her some and dolphus can have a racket now then fly round and driving her prey before her josie returned in triumph to the court casting himself ponderously upon the bench which creaked under his weight stuffy as we will continue to call him though no one else dared to use the old name now promptly produced the box of confectionery without which he never travelled far and regaled bess with candied violets and other dainties while dolly worked hard to hold his own against a most accomplished antagonist he would have beaten her if an unlucky stumble which produced an unsightly stain upon the knee of those new shorts had not distracted his mind and made him careless much elated at her victory josie permitted him to rest and offered ironical consolation for the mishap which evidently weighed upon his mind don't be an old betty it can be claimed you must have been a cat in some former state you are so troubled about dirt or a tailor and lived for clothes come now don't hit a fellow when he is down responded dolly from the grass where he and stuffy now lay to make room for both girls on the seat 
one handkerchief was spread under him and his elbow leaned upon another while his eyes were sadly fixed upon the green and brown spot which afflicted him i like to be neat don't think it's civil to cut about in old shoes and grey flannel shirts before ladies our fellows are gentlemen and dress as such he added rather nettled at the word tailor for he owed one of those two attractive persons an uncomfortably big bill so are ours but good clothes alone don't make a gentleman here we require a good deal more flashed josie in arms at once to defend her college you will hear of some of the men in old boots and grey flannel when you and your fine gentlemen are twiddling your ties and scenting your hair in obscurity i like old boots and wear them i hate dandies don't you bess not when they are kind to me and belong to our old set answered bess with a nod of thanks to dolly who was carefully removing an inquisitive caterpillar from one of her little russet shoes i like a lady who is always polite and doesn't snap a man's head off if he has a mind of his own don't you george asked dolly with his best smile for bess and a harvard stare of disapprobation for josie a tranquil snore was stuffy's sole reply and a general laugh restored peace for the moment but josie loved to harass the lords of creation who asserted themselves too much and bided her time for another attack till she had secured more tennis she got another game for dolly was a sworn knight of dames so he obeyed her call leaving bess to sketch george as he lay upon his back his stout legs crossed and his round red face partially eclipsed by his hat josie got beaten this time and came back rather cross so she woke the peaceful sleeper by tickling his nose with a straw till he sneezed himself into a sitting posture and looked wrathfully about for that confounded boy come sit up and let us have a little elegant conversation you howling swells ought to improve our minds and manners for we are only poor country girls in dowdy gowns and hats began the gadfly opening the battle with a sly quotation from one of dolly's unfortunate speeches about certain studious damsels who cared more for books than finery i didn't mean you your gowns are all right and those hats the latest thing out began poor dolphus convicting himself by the incautious exclamation caught you that time i thought you fellows were all gentlemen civil as well as nice but you are always sneering at girls who don't dress well and that is a very unmanly thing to do my mother said so and josie felt that she had dealt a shrewd blow at the elegant youth who bowed at many shrines if they were well decorated ones i <laughs> got you there old boy and she's right you never hear me talk about clothes and such twaddle said stuffy suppressing a yawn and feeling for another bonbon wherewith to refresh himself you talk about eating and that is even worse for a man he will marry a cook and keep a restaurant some day laughed josie down on him at once this fearful prediction kept him silent for several moments but dolly rallied and wisely changing the subject carried war into the enemy's camp as you wanted us to improve your manners allow me to say that young ladies in good society don't make personal remarks or deliver lectures little girls who are not out do it and think it witty but i assure you it's not good form josie paused a moment to recover from the shock of being called a little girl when all the honors of her fourteenth birthday were fresh upon her and bess said in the lofty tone which was infinitely more crushing than joe's impertinence that is true but we have lived all our lives with superior people so we have no society talk like your young ladies we are so accustomed to sensible conversation and helping one another by telling our faults that we have no gossip to offer you when the princess reproved the boy seldom resented it so dolly held his peace and josie burst out following her cousin's lead which she thought a happy one our boys like to have us talk with them and take kindly any hints we give they don't think they know everything and are quite perfect at eighteen as i've observed the harvard men do 
especially the very young ones josie took immense satisfaction in that return shot and dolly showed that he was hit by the nettled tone in which he answered with a supercilious glance at the hot dusty and noisy crowd on the baseball ground the class of fellows you have here need all the polish and culture you can give them and i'm glad they get it our men are largely from the best families all over the country so we don't need girls to teach us anything it's a pity you don't have more of such fellows as ours they value and use well what college gives them and aren't satisfied to slip through getting all the fun they can and shirking the work oh i've heard you men talk and heard your fathers say they wish they hadn't wasted time and money just that you might say you'd been through college as for the girls you'll be much better off in all ways when they do get in and keep you lazy things up to the mark as we do here if you have such a poor opinion of us why do you wear our color asked dolly painfully conscious that he was not improving the advantages his alma mater offered him but bound to defend her i don't my head is scarlet not crimson much you know about a color scoffed josie i know that a cross cow would soon set you scampering if you flaunted that red tile under her nose retorted dolly i'm ready for her can your fine young ladies do this or you either and burning to display her latest accomplishment josie ran to the nearest gate put one hand on the top rail and vaulted over as lightly as a bird bess shook her head and stuffy languidly applauded but dolly scorning to be braved by a girl took a flying leap and landed on his feet beside josie saying calmly can you do that not yet but i will by and by as his foe looked a little crestfallen dolly relented and affably added sundry feats of a like nature quite unconscious that he had fallen into a dreadful snare for the dull red paint on the gate not being used to such vigorous handling came off in streaks upon his shoulders when he turned a backward swing and came up smiling to be rewarded with the aggravating remark if you want to know what crimson is look at your back it's nicely stamped on and won't wash out i think the deuce it won't cried dolly trying to get an impossible view and giving it up in great disgust i guess we'd better be going off said peaceable stuffy feeling that it would be wise to retreat before another skirmish took place as his side seemed to be getting the worst of it don't hurry i beg stay and rest you must need it after the tremendous amount of brain work you've done this week it is our time for greek come bess good afternoon gentlemen and with a sweeping courtesy josie led the way with her hat belligerently cocked up and her racket borne like a triumphal banner over one shoulder for having had the last word she felt that she could retire with the honors of war dolly gave bess his best bow with the chill on and stuffy subsided luxuriously with his legs in the air murmuring in a dreamy tone little joe is as cross as two sticks to-day i'm going in for another nap too hot to play anything so it is wonder if spitfire was right about these beastly spots and dolly sat down to try dry cleansing with one of his handkerchiefs asleep he asked after a few moments of this cheerful occupation fearing that his chum might be too comfortable when he was in a fume himself no i was thinking that joe wasn't far wrong about shirking tis a shame to get so little done when we ought to be grinding like morton and tory and that lot i never wanted to go to college my governor made me much good it will do either of us answered stuffy with a groan for he hated work and saw two more long years of it before him gives a man prestige you know no need to dig i mean to have a gay old time and be a howling swell if i choose between you and me though it would be no and jolly to have the girls along study be hanged but if we've got to turn the grindstone it would be mighty nice to have some of the little dears to lend a hand wouldn't it now i'd like three this minute one to fan me one to kiss me 
and one to give me some ice lemonade sighed stuffy with a yearning glance towards the house whence no succour appeared how would rootbeer do asked a voice behind them which made dolly spring to his feet and stuffy roll over like a startled porpoise sitting on the stile that crossed the wall near by was mrs joe with two jugs slung over her shoulder by a strap several tin mugs in her hand and an old-fashioned sunbonnet on her head i knew the boys would be killing themselves with ice water so i strolled down with some of my good wholesome beer they drank like fishes but silas was with me so my crew still holds out have some yes thanks very much let us pour it and dolly held the cup while stuffy joyfully filled it both very grateful but rather afraid she had heard what went before the wish she fulfilled she proved that she had by saying as they stood drinking her health while she sat between them looking like a middle-aged vivandiere with her jugs and mugs i was glad to hear you say you would like to have girls at your college but i hope you will learn to speak more respectfully of them before they come for that will be the first lesson they will teach you well really ma'am i was only joking began stuffy gulping down his beer in a hurry so was i i'm sure i am devoted to em stuttered dolly panic-stricken for he saw that he was in for a lecture of some sort not in the right way frivolous girls may like to be called little dears and things of that sort but the girls who love to study wish to be treated like reasonable beings not dolls to flirt with yes i'm going to preach that's my business so stand up and take it like men mrs joe laughed but she was in earnest for by various hints and signs during the past winter she knew that the boys were beginning to see life in the way she especially disapproved both were far from home had money enough to waste and were as inexperienced curious and credulous as most lads of their age not fond of books therefore without the safeguard which keeps many studious fellows out of harm one self-indulgent indolent and so used to luxury that pampering of the senses was an easy thing the other vain as all comely boys are full of conceit and so eager to find favour in the eyes of his comrades that he was ready for anything which would secure it these traits and foibles made both peculiarly liable to the temptations which assail pleasure-loving and weak-willed boys mrs joe knew them well and had dropped many a warning word since they went to college but till lately they seemed not to understand some of her friendly hints now she was sure they would and meant to speak out for long experience with boys made her both bold and skilful in handling some of the dangers usually left to silence till it is too late for anything but pity and reproach i'm going to talk to you like a mother because yours are far away and there are things that mothers can manage best if they do their duty she solemnly began from the depths of the sunbonnet great scott we're in for it now thought dolly in secret dismay while stuffy got the first blow by trying to sustain himself with another mug of beer that won't hurt you but i must warn you about drinking other things george overeating is an old story and a few more fits of illness will teach you to be wise but drinking is a more serious thing and leads to worse harm than any that can afflict your body alone i hear you talk about wines as if you knew them and cared more for them than a boy should and several times i have heard jokes that meant mischief for heaven's sake don't begin to play with this dangerous taste for fun as you say or because it's the fashion and the other fellows do it stop at once and learn that temperance in all things is the only safe rule upon my honour i only take wine and iron i need a tonic mother says to repair the waste of brain tissue while i'm studying protested stuffy putting down the mug as if it burnt his fingers good beef and oatmeal will repair your tissues much better than any tonic of that sort work and plain fare are what you want and i wish i had you here for a few months out of harm's way i'd banting you and fit you to run without puffing and get on without four or five meals a day what an absurd hand that is for a man you ought to be ashamed of it 
and mrs joe caught up the plump fist with deep dimples at each knuckle which was fumbling distressfully at the buckle of the belt girt about a waist far too large for a youth of his age i can't help it we all grow fat it's in the family said stuffy in self-defence all the more reason you should live carefully do you want to die early or be an invalid all your life no ma'am stuffy looked so scared that mrs joe could not be hard upon his budding sins for they lay at his overindulgent mother's door line in a great measure so she softened the tone of her voice and added with a little slap on the fat hand as she used to do when it was small enough to pilfer lumps of sugar from her bowl then be careful for a man writes his character in his face and you don't want gluttony and intemperance in yours i know i'm sure i don't please make out a wholesome bill of fare and i'll stick to it if i can i'm getting stout and i don't like it and my liver's torpid and i have palpitations and headache overwork mother says but it may be overeaten and stuffy gave a sigh of mingled regret for the good things he renounced and relief as he finished loosening his belt as soon as his hand was free i will follow it and in a year you'll be a man and not a meal-bag now dolly and mrs joe turned to the other culprit who shook in his shoes and wished he hadn't come are you studying french as industriously as you were last winter no ma'am i don't care for it that is i am busy with g -g greek just now answered dolly beginning bravely quite in the dark as to what that odd question meant till a sudden memory made him stutter and look at his shoes with deep interest oh he doesn't study it only reads french novels and goes to the theatre when the opera booth is here said stuffy innocently confirming mrs joe's suspicions so i understood and that is what i want to speak about ted had a sudden desire to learn french in that way from something you said dolly so i went myself and was quite satisfied that it was no place for a decent boy your men were out in full force and i was glad to see that some of the younger ones looked as ashamed as i felt the older fellows enjoyed it and when we came out were waiting to take those painted girls to supper did you ever go with them once did you like it no am um, i i came away early stammered dolly with a face as red as his splendid tie i am glad you have not lost the grace of blushing yet but you soon will if you keep up this sort of study and forget to be ashamed the society of such women will unfit you for that of good ones and lead you into trouble and sin and shame oh why don't the city fathers stop that evil thing when they know the harm it does it made my heart ache to see those boys who ought to be at home and in their beds going off for a night of riot which would help to ruin some of them for ever the youth looked scared at mrs joe's energetic protest against one of the fashionable pleasures of the day and waited in conscience-stricken silence stuffy glad that he never went to those gay suppers and dolly deeply grateful that he came away early with a hand on either shoulder and all the terror smoothed from her brow mrs joe went on in her most motherly tone anxious to do for them what no other woman would and do it kindly my dear boys if i didn't love you i would not say these things i know they are not pleasant but my conscience won't let me hold my peace when a word may keep you from two of the great sins that curse the world and send so many young men to destruction you are just beginning to feel the allurement of them and soon it will be hard to turn away stop now i beg of you and not only save yourselves but help others by a brave example come to me if things worry you don't be afraid or ashamed i have heard many sadder confessions than any you are ever likely to bring me and been able to comfort many poor fellows gone wrong for want of a word in time do this and you will be able to kiss your mothers with clean lips and by and by have the right to ask innocent girls to love you yes um thank you i suppose you're right but it's pretty hard work to toe the mark when ladies give you wine and gentlemen take their daughters to see amy said dolly foreseeing tribulations ahead though he knew it was time to pull up so it is but all the more honour to those who are brave and wise enough to resist public opinion 
and the easy-going morals of bad or careless men and women think of the persons whom you respect most and in imitating them you will secure the respect of those who look up to you i'd rather my boy should be laughed at and cold-shouldered by a hundred foolish fellows than lose what once gone no power can give them back innocence and self-respect i don't wonder you find it hard to toe the mark when books pictures ballrooms theatres and streets offer temptations yet you can resist if you try last winter mrs brooke used to worry about john's being out so late reporting but when she spoke to him about the things he must see and hear on his way to and from the office at midnight he said in his sober way i know what you mean mother but no fellow need to go wrong unless he wants to that's like the deacon exclaimed stuffy with an approving smile on his fat face i'm glad you told me that he's right and it's because he doesn't want to go wrong we all respect him so added dolly looking up now with an expression which assured his mentor that the right string had been touched and a spirit of emulation roused more helpful perhaps than any words of hers seeing this she was satisfied and said as she prepared to leave the bar before which her culprits had been tried and found guilty but recommended to mercy then be to others what john is to you a good example forgive me for troubling you my dear lads and remember my little preachment i think it will do you good though i may never know it chance words spoken in kindness often help amazingly and that's what old people are here for else their experience is of little use now come and find the young folk i hope i shall never have to shut the gates of plumfield upon you as i have on some of your gentlemen i mean to keep my boys and girls safe if i can and this is a wholesome place where the good old-fashioned virtues are lived and taught much impressed by that dire threat dolly helped her from her perch with deep respect and stuffy relieved her of her empty jugs solemnly vowing to abstain from all fermented beverages except root beer as long as feeble flesh could hold out of course they made light of mother bear's lecture when they were alone that was to be expected of men of our class but in their secret souls they thanked her for giving their boyish consciences a jog and more than once afterward had cause to remember gratefully that half hour in the tennis court End of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of joe's boys by louisa may alcott this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org joe's boys by louisa may alcott chapter seventeen among the maids although this story is about joe's boys her girls cannot be neglected because they held a high place in this little republic and a special care was taken to fit them to play their parts worthily in the great republic which offered them wider opportunities and more serious duties to many the social influence was the better part of the training they received for education is not confined to books and the finest characters often graduate from no college but make experience their master and life their book others cared only for the mental culture and were in danger of overstudying under the delusion which pervades new england that learning must be had at all costs forgetting that health and real wisdom are better a third class of ambitious girls hardly knew what they wanted but were hungry for whatever could fit them to face the world and earn a living being driven by necessity the urgency of some half-conscious talent or the restlessness of strong young natures to break away from the narrow life which no longer satisfied at plumfield all found something to help them for the growing institution had not yet made its rules as fixed as the laws of the medes and persians and believed so heartily in the right of all sexes colors 
creeds and ranks to education that there was room for every one who knocked and a welcome to the shabby youths from up country the eager girls from the west the awkward freedman or woman from the south or the well-born student whose poverty made this college a possibility when other doors were barred there still was prejudice ridicule neglect in high places and prophecies of failure to contend against but the faculty was composed of cheerful hopeful men and women who had seen greater reforms spring from smaller roots and after stormy seasons blossom beautifully to add prosperity and honor to the nation so they worked on steadily and bided their time full of increasing faith in their attempt as year after year their numbers grew their plans succeeded and the sense of usefulness in this most vital of all professions blessed them with its sweet rewards among the various customs which had very naturally sprung up was one especially useful and interesting to the girls as the young women liked to be called it all grew out of the old sewing hour still kept up by the three sisters long after the little work boxes had expanded into big baskets full of household mending they were busy women yet on saturdays they tried to meet in one of the three sewing rooms for even classic parnassus had its nook where mrs amy often sat among her servants teaching them to make and mend thereby giving them a respect for economy since the rich lady did not scorn to darn her hose and sew on buttons in these household retreats with books and work and their daughters by them they read and sewed and talked in the sweet privacy that domestic women love and can make so helpful by a wise mixture of cooks and chemistry table linen and theology prosaic duties and good poetry mrs meg was the first to propose enlarging this little circle for as she went her motherly rounds among the young women she found a sad lack of order skill and industry in this branch of education latin greek the higher mathematics and science of all sorts prospered finely but the dust gathered on the work baskets frayed elbows went unheeded and some of the blue stockings sadly needed mending anxious lest the usual sneer at learned women should apply to our girls she gently lured two or three of the most untidy to her house and made the hour so pleasant the lesson so kindly that they took the hint were grateful for the favor and asked to come again others soon begged to make the detested weekly duty lighter by joining the party and soon it was a privilege so much desired that the old museum was refitted with sewing machines tables rocking chair and a cheerful fireplace so that rain or shine the needles might go on undisturbed here mrs meg was in her glory and stood wielding her big shears like a queen as she cut out white work fitted dresses and directed daisy her special aid about the trimming of hats and completing the lace and ribbon trifles which add grace to the simplest costume and save poor or busy girls so much money and time mrs amy contributed taste and decided the great question of colors and complexions for few women even the most learned are without that desire to look well which makes many a plain face comely as well as many a pretty one ugly for want of skill and knowledge of the fitness of things she also took her turn to provide books for the readings and as art was her forte she gave them selections from Ruskin hammerton and mrs jameson who is never old bess read these aloud as her contribution and josie took her turn at the romances poetry and plays her uncles recommended mrs joe gave little lectures on health religion 
politics and the various questions in which all should be interested with copious extracts from miss cobb's duties of women miss brackett's education of american girls mrs duffy's no sex in education mrs woolson's dress reform and many of the other excellent books wise women write for their sisters now that they are waking up and asking what shall we do it was curious to see the prejudices melt away as ignorance was enlightened indifference changed to interest and intelligent minds set thinking while quick wits and lively tongues added spice to the discussions which inevitably followed so the feet that wore the neatly mended hose carried wiser heads than before the pretty gowns covered hearts warmed with higher purposes and the hands that dropped the thimbles for pens lexicons and celestial globes were better fitted for life's work whether to rock cradles tend the sick or help on the great work of the world one day a brisk discussion arose concerning careers for women mrs joe had read something on the subject and asked each of the dozen girls sitting about the room what she intended to do on leaving college the answers were as usual i shall teach help mother study medicine art etc but nearly all ended with till i marry but what if you don't marry what then asked mrs joe feeling like a girl again as she listened to the answers and watched the thoughtful gay or eager faces be old maids i suppose horrid but inevitable since there are so many superfluous women answered a lively lass too pretty to fear single blessedness unless she chose it it is well to consider that fact and fit yourselves to be useful not superfluous women that class by the way is largely made up of widows i find so don't consider it a slur on maidenhood that's a comfort old maids aren't sneered at half as much as they used to be since some of them have grown famous and proved that woman isn't a half but a whole human being and can stand alone don't like it all the same we can't all be like miss nightingale miss phelps and the rest so what can we do but sit in a corner and look on asked a plain girl with a dissatisfied expression cultivate cheerfulness and content if nothing else but there are so many little odd jobs waiting to be done that nobody need sit idle and look on unless she chooses said mrs meg with a smile laying on the girl's head the new hat she had just trimmed thank you very much yes mrs brooke i see it's a little job but it makes me neat and happy and grateful she added looking up with brighter eyes as she accepted the labor of love and the lesson as sweetly as they were given one of the best and most beloved women i know has been doing odd jobs for the lord for years and will keep at it till her dear hands are folded in her coffin all sorts of things she does picks up neglected children and puts them in safe homes saves lost girls nurses poor women in trouble sews knits trots begs works for the poor day after day with no reward but the thanks of the needy the love and honor of the rich who make st matilda their almoner that's a life worth living and i think that quiet little woman will get a higher seat in heaven than many of those of whom the world has heard i know it's lovely mrs bear but it's dull for young folks we do want a little fun before we buckle to said a western girl with a wide-awake face have your fun my dear but if you must earn your bread try to make it sweet with cheerfulness not bitter with the daily regret that it isn't cake i used to think mine was a very hard fate because i had to amuse a somewhat fretful old lady but the books i read in that lonely library have been of immense use to me since and the dear old soul bequeathed me plumfield for my cheerful service and affectionate care i didn't deserve it but i did used to try and be jolly and kind and get as much honey out of duty as i could thanks to my dear mother's help and advice gracious if i could earn a place like this i'd sing all day and be an angel but you have to take your chance and get nothing for your pains perhaps 
i never do said the westerner who had a hard time with small means and large aspirations don't do it for the reward but be sure it will come though not in the shape you expect i worked hard for fame and money one winter but i got neither and was much disappointed a year afterwards i found i had earned two prizes my skill with my pen and professor bear mrs joe's laugh was echoed blithely by the girls who liked to have these conversations enlivened by illustrations from life you are a very lucky woman began the discontented damsel whose soul soared above new hats welcome as they were but did not quite know where to steer yet her name used to be luckless joe and she never had what she wanted till she had given up hoping for it said mrs meg i'll give up hoping then right away and see if my wishes will come i only want to help my folks and get a good school take this proverb for your guide get the distaff ready and the lord will send the flax answered mrs joe we'd better all do that if we are to be spinsters said the pretty one adding gaily i think i should like it on the whole they are so independent my aunt jenny can do just what she likes and ask no one's leave but ma has to consult pa about everything yes i'll give you my chance sally and be a superfluum as mr plock says you'll be one of the first to go into bondage see if you aren't much obliged all the same well i'll get my distaff ready and take whatever flax the fates send single or double twisted <laughs> as the powers please that's the right spirit nelly keep it up and see how happy life will be with a brave heart a willing hand and plenty to do no one objects to plenty of domestic work or fashionable pleasure i find but the minute we begin to study people tell us we can't bear it and warn us to be very careful i've tried the other things and got so tired i came to college though my people predict nervous exhaustion and an early death do you think there is any danger asked a stately girl with an anxious glance at the blooming face reflected in the mirror opposite are you stronger or weaker than when you came two years ago miss winthrop stronger in body and much happier in mind i think i was dying of ennui but the doctors called it inherited delicacy of constitution that is why mamma is so anxious and i wish not to go too fast don't worry my dear that active brain of yours was starving for good food it has plenty now and plain living suits you better than luxury and dissipation it is all nonsense about girls not being able to study as well as boys neither can bear cramming but with proper care both are better for it so enjoy the life your instinct led you to and we will prove that wise headwork is a better cure for that sort of delicacy than tonics and novels on the sofa where far too many of our girls go to wreck nowadays they burn the candle at both ends and when they break down they blame the books not the balls dr nan was telling me about a patient of hers who thought she had heart complaint till nan made her take off her corsets stopped her coffee and dancing all night and made her eat sleep walk and live regularly for a time and now she's a brilliant cure common sense versus custom nan said i've had no headache since i came here and could do twice as much studying as i did at home it's the air i think and the fun of going ahead of the boys said another girl tapping her big forehead with her thimble as if the lively brain inside was in good working order and enjoyed the daily gymnastics she gave it quality not quantity wins the day you know our brains may be smaller but i don't see that they fall short of what is required of them and if i'm not mistaken the largest-headed man in our class is the dullest said nelly with a solemn air which produced a gale of merriment for all knew that the young goliath she mentioned had been metaphorically slain by this quick-witted david on many a battlefield to the great disgust of himself and his mates mrs brooke do i gauge on the right or the wrong side 
asked the best greek scholar of her class eyeing a black silk apron with a lost expression the right miss pearson and leave a space between the tucks it looks prettier so i'll never make another but it will save my dresses from ink stains so i'm glad i've got it and the erudite miss pearson labored on finding it a harder task than any greek root she ever dug up we paper stainers must learn how to make shields or we are lost i'll give you a pattern of the pinafore i used to wear in my blood and thunder days as we call them said mrs joe trying to remember what became of the old tin kitchen which used to hold her works speaking of writers reminds me that my ambition is to be a george eliot and thrill the world it must be so splendid to know that one has such power and to hear people own that one possesses a masculine intellect i don't care for most women's novels but hers are immense don't you think so mrs bear asked the girl with the big forehead and torn braid on her skirt yes but they don't thrill me as little charlotte bronte's books do the brain is there but the heart seems left out i admire but i don't love george eliot and her life is far sadder to me than miss bronte's because in spite of the genius love and fame she missed the light without which no soul is truly great good or happy yes um, i know but still it's so romantic and sort of new and mysterious and she was great in one sense her nerves and dyspepsia do rather destroy the illusion but i adore famous people and mean to go and see all i can scare up in london some day you will find some of the best of them busy about just the work i recommend to you and if you want to see a great lady i'll tell you that mrs lawrence means to bring one here to-day lady abercrombie is lunching with her and after seeing the college is to call on us she especially wanted to see our sewing school as she is interested in things of this sort and gets them up at home bless me i always imagined lords and ladies did nothing but ride round in a coach and six go to balls and be presented to the queen in cocked hats and trains and feathers exclaimed an artless young person from the wilds of maine whither an illustrated paper occasionally wandered not at all lord abercrombie is over here studying up our american prison system and my lady is busy with the schools both very high-born but the simplest and most sensible people i've met this long time they are neither of them young nor handsome and dress plainly so don't expect anything splendid mr lawrence was telling me last night about a friend of his who met my lord in the hall and owing to a rough greatcoat and a red face mistook him for a coachman and said now my man what do you want here <laughs> lord ambercrombie mildly mentioned who he was and that he had come to dinner and the poor host was much afflicted saying afterwards why didn't he wear his stars and gaiters then a fellow would know he was a lord the girls laughed again and a general rustle betrayed that each was prinking a bit before the titled guest arrived even mrs joe settled her collar and mrs meg felt if her cap was right while bess shook out her curls and josie boldly consulted the glass for they were women in spite of philosophy and philanthropy shall we all rise asked one girl deeply impressed by the impending honor it would be courteous shall we shake hands no i'll present you en masse and your pleasant faces will be introduction enough i wish i'd worn my best dress ought to have told us whispered sally won't my folks be surprised when i tell them we have had a real lady to call on us said another don't look as if you've never seen a gentlewoman before milly we are not all fresh from the wilderness added the stately damsel who having mayflower ancestors felt that she was the equal of all the crowned heads of europe hush she's coming oh my heart what a bonnet cried the gay girl in a stage whisper and every eye was demurely fixed upon the busy hands as the door opened to admit mrs lawrence and her guest 
it was rather a shock to find after the general introduction was over that this daughter of a hundred earls was a stout lady in a plain gown and a rather weather-beaten bonnet with a bag of papers in one hand and a notebook in the other but the face was full of benevolence the sonorous voice very kind the genial manners very winning and about the whole person an indescribable air of high breeding which made beauty of no consequence costume soon forgotten and the moment memorable to the keen-eyed girls whom nothing escaped a little chat about the rise growth and success of this particular class and then mrs joe led the conversation to the english lady's work anxious to show her pupils how rank dignifies labor and charity blesses wealth it was good for these girls to hear of the evening schools supported and taught by women whom they knew and honored of miss cobb's eloquent protest winning the protection of the law for abused wives mrs butler saving the lost mrs taylor who devoted one room in her historic house to a library for the servants lord shaftesbury busy with his new tenement houses in the slums of london of prison reforms and all the brave work being done in god's name by the rich and great for the humble and the poor it impressed them more than many quiet home lectures would have done and roused an ambition to help when their time should come well knowing that even in glorious america there is still plenty to be done before she is what she should be truly just and free and great they were also quick to see that lady abercrombie treated all there as her equals from stately mrs lawrence to little josie taking notes of everything and privately resolving to have some thick-soled english boots as soon as possible no one would have guessed that she had a big house in london a castle in wales and a grand country seat in scotland as she spoke of parnassus with admiration plumfield as a dear old home and the college as an honor to all concerned in it at that of course every head went up a little and when my lady left every hand was ready for the hearty shake the noble englishwoman gave them with words they long remembered i am very pleased to see this much neglected branch of a woman's education so well conducted here and i have to thank my friend mrs lawrence for one of the most charming pictures i've seen in america penelope among her maids a group of smiling faces watched the stout boots trudge away respectful glances followed the shabby bonnet till it was out of sight and the girls felt a truer respect for their titled guest than if she had come in the coach and six with all her diamonds on i feel better about the odd jobs now i only wish i could do them as well as lady abercrombie does said one i thanked my stars my buttonholes were nice for she looked at them and said quite workmanlike upon my word added another feeling that her gingham gown had come to honour her manners were as sweet and kind as mrs brooks not a bit stiff or condescending as i expected i see now what you meant mrs bear when you said once that well-bred people were the same all the world over mrs meg bowed her thanks for the compliment and mrs bear said i know them when i see them but never shall be a model of deportment myself i'm glad you enjoyed the little visit now if you young people don't want england to get ahead of us in many ways you must bestir yourselves and keep abreast for our sisters are in earnest you see and don't waste time worrying about their sphere but make it whatever duty calls them we, we will, will do, do our, our best, best ma'am answered the girls heartily and trooped away with their work baskets feeling that though they might never be harriet martineau's elizabeth browning's or george eliot's they might become noble useful and independent women and earn for themselves some sweet title from the grateful lips of the poor better than any a queen could bestow End of chapter 17
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Joe's Boys by Louisa May Alcott Chapter 18 Class Day the clerk of the weather evidently has a regard for young people and sends sunshine for class days as often as he can an especially lovely one shone over plumfield as this interesting anniversary came round bringing the usual accompaniment of roses strawberries white-gowned girls beaming youths proud friends and stately dignitaries full of well-earned satisfaction with the yearly harvest as Lawrence College was a mixed one, the presence of young women as students gave to the occasion a grace and animation entirely wanting where the picturesque half of creation appear merely as spectators. The hands that turned the pages of wise books also possessed the skill to decorate the hall with flowers. Eyes tired with study shone with hospitable warmth on the assembling guests and under the white muslins beat hearts as full of ambition, hope, and courage as those agitating the broadcloth of the ruling sex. College Hill, Parnassus, and Old Plum swarmed with cheery faces as guests, students, and professors hurried to and fro in the pleasant excitement of arriving and receiving. Everyone was welcomed cordially, whether he rolled up in a fine carriage or trudged afoot to see the good son or daughter come to honor on the happy day that rewarded many a mutual sacrifice. Mr. Lorry and his wife were on the reception committee, and their lovely house was overflowing. Mrs. Meg, with Daisy and Joe as aides, was in demand among the girls, helping on belated toilettes, giving an eye to spreads, and directing the decorations. Mrs. Joe had her hands full as President's lady, and the mother of Ted, for it took all the power and skill of that energetic woman to get her son into his Sunday best. Not that he objected to be well arrayed, far from it, he adored good clothes, and owing to his great height, already reveled in a dress suit, bequeathed him by a dandy friend. The effect was very funny, but he would wear it in spite of the jeers of his mates, and sighed vainly for a beaver, because his stern parent drew the line there. He pleaded that English lads of ten wore them, and were no end knobby but his mother only answered with a consoling pat of the yellow mane my child you are absurd enough now if i let you add a tall hat plumfield wouldn't hold either of us such would be the scorn and derision of all beholders content yourself with looking like the ghost of a waiter and don't ask for the most ridiculous headgear in the known world Denied this noble badge of manhood, Ted soothed his wounded soul by appearing in collars of an amazing height and stiffness, and ties which were the wonder of all female eyes. This freak was a sort of vengeance on his hard-hearted mother, for the collars drove the laundress to despair, never being just right, and the ties required such art in the tying that three women sometimes labored long before, like Beau Brummel, he turned from a heap of failures with the welcome words that will do. Rob was devoted on these trying occasions, his own toilet being distinguished only by its speed, simplicity, and neatness. Ted was usually in a frenzy before he was suited, and Roar's whistles commands and groans were heard from the den wherein the lion raged and the lamb patiently toiled mrs joe bore it till boots were hurled and a rain of hairbrushes set in then fearing for the safety of her eldest she would go to the rescue and by a wise mixture of fun and authority finally succeed in persuading ted that he was a thing of beauty if not a joy forever at last he would stalk majestically forth 
imprisoned in collars compared to which those worn by dickens afflicted byler were trifles not worth mentioning the dress coat was a little loose in the shoulders but allowed a noble expanse of glossy bosom to be seen and with a delicate handkerchief negligently drooping at the proper angle had a truly fine effect boots that shone and likewise pinched appeared at one end of the long black clothespin as josie called him and a youthful but solemn face at the other carried at an angle which if long continued would have resulted in spinal curvature light gloves a cane and oh bitter drop in the cup of joy an ignominious straw hat not to mention a choice flowerette in the buttonhole and a festoon of watch guard below finished off this impressive boy how's that for style he asked appearing to his mother and cousins whom he was to escort to the hall on this particular occasion a shout of laughter greeted him followed by exclamations of horror for he had artfully added the little blonde mustache he often wore when acting it was very becoming and seemed the only balm to heal the wound made by the loss of the beloved hat take it off this moment you audacious boy what would your father say to such a prank on this day when we must all behave our best said mrs joe trying to frown but privately thinking that among the many youths about her none were so beautiful and original as her long son let him wear it auntie it's so becoming no one will ever guess he isn't eighteen at least cried josie to whom disguise of any sort was always charming father won't observe it he'll be absorbed in his bigwigs and the girls no matter if he does he'll enjoy the joke and introduce me as his oldest son rob is nowhere when i'm in full fig and ted took the stage with a tragic stalk like hamlet in a tail-coat and choker my son obey me and when mrs joe spoke in that tone her word was law later however the mustache appeared and many strangers firmly believed that there were three young bears so ted found one ray of joy to light his gloom mr bear was a proud and happy man when at the appointed hour he looked down upon the parterre of youthful faces before him thinking of the little gardens in which he had hopefully and faithfully sowed good seed years ago and from which this beautiful harvest seemed to have sprung mr march's fine old face shone with the serenest satisfaction for this was the dream of his life fulfilled after patient waiting and the love and reverence in the countenances of the eager young men and women looking up at him plainly showed that the reward he coveted was his in fullest measure lorry always effaced himself on these occasions as much as courtesy would permit for every one spoke gratefully in ode poem and oration of the founder of the college and noble dispenser of his beneficence the three sisters beamed with pride as they sat among the ladies enjoying as only women can the honor done the men they loved while the original plums as the younger ones called themselves regarded the whole affair as their work receiving the curious admiring or envious glances of strangers with a mixture of dignity and delight rather comical to behold the music was excellent and well it might be when apollo waved the baton the poems were as usual on such occasions of varied excellence as the youthful speakers tried to put old truths into new words and made them forceful by the enthusiasm of their earnest faces and fresh voices it was beautiful to see the eager interest with which the girls listened to some brilliant brother student and applauded him with a rustle as of wind over a bed of flowers 
it was still more significant and pleasant to watch the young men's faces when a slender white figure stood out against the background of black-coated dignitaries and with cheeks that flushed and paled and lips that trembled till earnest purpose conquered maiden fear spoke to them straight out of a woman's heart and brain concerning the hopes and doubts the aspirations and rewards all must know desire and labor for this clear sweet voice seemed to reach and rouse all that was noblest in the souls of these youths and to set a seal upon the years of comradeship which made them sacred and memorable for ever alice heath's oration was unanimously pronounced the success of the day for without being flowery or sentimental as is too apt to be the case with these first efforts of youthful orators it was earnest sensible and so inspiring that she left the stage in a storm of applause the good fellows being as much fired by her stirring appeal to march shoulder to shoulder as if she had chanted the marseillaise then and there one young man was so excited that he nearly rushed out of his seat to receive her as she hastened to hide herself among her mates who welcomed her with faces full of tender pride and tearful eye a prudent sister detained him however and in a moment he was able to listen with composure to the president's remarks they were worth listening to for Mr. Bear spoke like a father to the children whom he was dismissing to the battle of life, and his tender, wise, and helpful words lingered in their hearts long after the praise was forgotten. Then came other exercises peculiar to Plumfield, and the end. Why the roof did not fly off when the sturdy lungs of the excited young men pealed out the closing hymn will forever be a mystery but it remained firm and only the fading garlands vibrated as the waves of music rolled up and died away leaving sweet echoes to haunt the place for another year dinners and spreads consumed the afternoon and at sunset came a slight lull as every one sought some brief repose before the festivities of the evening began the president's reception was one of the enjoyable things in store also dancing on parnassus and as much strolling singing and flirting as could be compressed into a few hours by youths and maidens just out of school carriages were rolling about and gay groups on piazzas lawns and window seats idly speculated as to who the distinguished guests might be the appearance of a very dusty vehicle loaded with trunks at mr bear's hospitably open door caused much curious comment among the loungers especially as two rather foreign-looking gentlemen sprang out followed by two young ladies all four being greeted with cries of joy and much embracing by the bears then they all disappeared into the house the luggage followed and the watchers were left to wonder who the mysterious strangers were till a fair collegian declared that they must be the professor's nephews one of whom was expected on his wedding journey she was right franz proudly presented his blonde and buxom bride and she was hardly kissed and blessed when emile led up his bonny english mary with the rapturous announcement uncle aunt joe here's another daughter have you room for my wife too there could be no doubt of that and mary was with difficulty rescued from the glad embraces of her new relatives who remembering all the young pair had suffered together felt that this was the natural and happy ending of the long voyage so perilously begun but why not tell us and let us make ready for two brides instead of one asked mrs joe looking as usual rather demoralizing in a wrapper and crimping pins having rushed down from her chamber where she was preparing for the labors of the evening well i remembered what a good joke you all considered uncle laurie's marriage and i thought i'd give you another nice little surprise laughed emile 
I'm off duty, and it seemed best to take advantage of wind and tide and come along as convoy to the old boy here. We hoped to get in last night, but couldn't fetch it, so here we are in time for the end of the jollification, anyway. Ah, oh, my sons, it is too feelingful to see you both so happy, and again in the old home. I have no words to outpour my gratitude, and can only ask of the dear God in Himmel to bless and keep you all cried professor bear trying to gather all four into his arms at once while tears rolled down his cheeks and his english failed him an april shower cleared the air and relieved the full hearts of the happy family then of course every one began to talk franz and ludmilla in german with uncle emile and mary with the aunts and round this group gathered the young folk clamouring to hear all about the wreck and the rescue and the homeward voyage it was a very different story from the written one and as they listened to emile's graphic words with mary's soft voice breaking in now and then to add some fact that brought out the courage patience and self-sacrifice he so lightly touched upon it became a solemn and pathetic thing to see and hear these happy creatures tell of that great danger and deliverance i never hear the patter of rain now that i don't want to say my prayers and as for women i'd like to take my hat off to every one of em for they are braver than any man i ever saw said emile with the new gravity that was as becoming to him as the new gentleness with which he treated every one if women are brave some men are as tender and self-sacrificing as women i know one who in the night slipped his share of food into a girl's pocket then starving himself and sat for hours rocking a sick man in his arms that he might get a little sleep no love i will tell and you must let me cried mary holding in both her own the hand he laid on her lips to silence her only did my duty if that torment had lasted much longer i might have been as bad as poor barry and the boatswain wasn't that an awful night and emile shuddered as he recalled it don't think of it dear tell about the happy days and the urania when papa grew better and we were all safe and homeward bound said mary with the trusting look and comforting touch which seemed to banish the dark and recall the bright side of that terrible experience emile cheered up at once and sitting with his arm about his dear lass in true sailor fashion told the happy ending of the tale such a jolly old time as we had at hamburg uncle herman couldn't do enough for the captain and while mamma took care of him mary looked after me i had to go into dock for repairs fire hurt my eyes and watching for a sail and want of sleep made him as hazy as a london fog she was pilot and brought me in all right you see only i couldn't part company so she came aboard as first mate and i'm bound straight for glory now hush that silly dear whispered mary trying in her turn to stop him with english shyness about tender topics but he took the soft hand in his and proudly surveying the one ring it wore went on with the air of an admiral aboard his flagship the captain proposed waiting a spell but i told him we weren't like to see any rougher weather than we'd pulled through together and if we didn't know one another after such a year as this we never should i was sure i shouldn't be worth my pay without this hand on the wheel so i had my way and my brave little woman is shipped for the long voyage god bless her shall you really sail with him asked daisy admiring her courage but shrinking with cat-like horror from the water i'm not afraid answered mary with a loyal smile i've proved my captain in fair weather and in foul and if he's ever wrecked again i'd rather be with him than waiting and watching ashore a true woman and a born sailor's wife you are a happy man emil and i'm sure this trip will be a prosperous one cried mrs joe delighted with the briny flavour of this courtship oh my dear boy i always felt you'd come back and when everyone else despaired i never gave up 
but insisted that you were clinging to the main top jib somewhere on that dreadful sea and mrs joe illustrated her faith by grasping emile with a truly pillicodian gesture of course i was answered emile heartily and my main top jib in this case was the thought of what you and uncle said to me that kept me up and among the million thoughts that came to me during those long nights none was clearer than the idea of the red strand you remember english navy and all that i liked the notion and resolved that if a bit of my cable was left afloat the red stripe should be there and it was my dear it was a captain hardy testifies to that and here is your reward and mrs joe kissed mary with a maternal tenderness which betrayed that she liked the english rose better than the blue-eyed german corn bloomin sweet and modest though it was emile surveyed the little ceremony with complacency saying as he looked about the room which he never thought to see again odd isn't it how clearly trifles come back to one in times of danger as we floated there half starved and in despair i used to think i heard the bells ringing here and ted tramping downstairs and you calling boys boys it's time to get up i smelt the coffee we used to have and one night i nearly cried when i woke from a dream of asia's ginger cookies i declare it was one of the bitterest disappointments of my life to face hunger with that spicy smell in my nostrils if you've got any do give me one a pitiful murmur broke from all the aunts and cousins and emile was at once borne away to feast on the desired cookies a supply always being on hand mrs joe and her sister joined the other group glad to hear what franz was saying about nat the minute i saw how thin and shabby he was i knew that something was wrong but he made light of it and was so happy over our visit and news that i let him off with a brief confession and went to professor baumgarten and bergman from them i learned the whole story of his spending more money than he ought and trying to atone for it by unnecessary work and sacrifice. Baumgarten thought it would do him good, so kept his secret till I came. It did him good, and he's paid his debts and earned his bread by the sweat of his brow, like an honest fellow. I like that much in Nat. It is, as I said, a lesson, and he learns it well. He proves himself a man, and has deserved the place Bergman offers him said mr bear looking well pleased as franz added some facts already recorded i told you meg that he had good stuff in him and love for daisy would keep him straight dear lad i wish i had him here this moment cried mrs joe forgetting in delight the doubts and anxieties which had troubled her for months past i am very glad and I suppose I shall give in, as I always do, especially now that the epidemic rages so among us. You and Emile have set all their heads in a ferment, and Josie will be demanding a lover before I can turn round, answered Mrs. Meg in a tone of despair. But her sister saw that she was touched by Nat's trials, and hastened to add the triumphs, that the victory might be complete, for success is always charming this offer of herr berkman is a good one isn't it she asked though mr lorry had already satisfied her on that point when nat's letter brought the news very fine in every way nat will get capital drill in bachmeister's orchestra see london in a delightful way and if he suits come home with them well started among the violins no great honor but a sure thing in a step up I congratulated him, and he was very jolly over it, saying, like the true lover he is, tell Daisy, be sure and tell her all about it. I'll leave that to you, Aunt Meg, and you can also break it gently to her that the old boy had a fine blonde beard, very becoming, hides his weak mouth, and gives a noble air to his big eyes and Mendelssohnian brow, as a gushing girl called it. Ludmilla has a photo of it for you. 
this amused them and they listened to many other interesting bits of news which kind franz even in his own happiness had not forgotten to remember for his friend's sake he talked so well and painted nat's patient and pathetic shifts so vividly that mrs meg was half won though if she had learned of the minna episode and the fiddling in beer gardens and streets she might not have relented so soon she stored up all she heard however and woman-like promised herself a delicious talk with daisy in which she would allow herself to melt by degrees and perhaps change the doubtful we shall see to a cordial he has done well be happy dear in the midst of this agreeable chat the sudden striking of a clock recalled mrs joe from romance to reality and she exclaimed with a clutch at her crimping pins my blessed people you must eat and rest and i must dress or receive in this disgraceful rig meg will you take ludmilla and mary upstairs and see to them franz knows the way to the dining-room fritz come with me and be made tidy for what with heat and emotion we are both perfect wrecks End of chapter eighteen